We're going to give everybody one more minute to join and then we'll get started. And while we're waiting for folks to join, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, I know we have quite a few folks joining us. So um, we obviously won't be able to do introductions, but we'd love to know uh, where you're coming from. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, that would be great. Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have a lot of really exciting info to share with you guys today. Uh, so welcome everyone to our second webinar in our hydrogen webinar series. Um, this is really a, an exciting webinar series where we have the opportunity to dive into kind of, you know, technical overview of hydrogen, hydrogen markets, tech economic considerations, social environmental considerations, just really uh, a really comprehensive overview of, of clean hydrogen, um, as well as some of the open source uh, laboratory tools that uh, you can use to help you in your decision making process uh, as you enter into your hydrogen projects. And so really excited to have you here in our second webinar of this series, um, where we will be focusing on how hydrogen can help to support climate targets. Um, so again, for those of you that are just joining, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'd like to pass it over to Sophie for some housekeeping items before we get started. Thanks. Thanks, Daniela. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to quickly walk through the housekeeping reminders just so we can get started with this really great content. So today we are recording this webinar. Please be aware that the recording has already begun and will be shared with all attendees following this live session. You will automatically be muted throughout the webinar. Um, we ask that you please use the chat feature, which it seems you all are very familiar with already. So please continue to keep that up and add comments and inputs throughout today's webinar. If you have any questions that you would like our panelists to address, then please put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them throughout today's session. And if you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to myself, Sophie Schrader, or my colleague, Isabel McCann, and we will do our best to assist you. Uh, you can adjust your audio through the audio settings, and you also are able to dial in via phone should you encounter any audio issues. We also are using a caption function, so you can turn that on by um, selecting captions and then selecting the language of your choice. So please do use that function. It's really, really helpful, especially if English is not your first language or if we're speaking too quickly. Um, we also will be launching a survey at the end of this event, and we really, really highly value your feedback, so please do consider submitting your feedback at the end. Um, and I think that covers it for housekeeping, so now we can dive right into the content and over to you, Joel. Thanks, Sophie. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Again, thank you for joining uh, today's uh, webinar. I know it's going to be super interesting. Uh, my name is Jal Desai. I'm a researcher at the U.S. National Renewable Energy um, Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. And NREL is the operating agent of the Clean Energy Solution Center, who is hosting today's uh, webinar. So I'll give a brief overview about Solution Center. So Solution Center is one of the work streams of the Clean Energy Ministerial. So the objective of Solution Center is to accelerate the transition of clean energy markets and technologies in developing and emerging economies. The co-leads for these initiatives are Australia and US. And as I mentioned earlier, Enrol is the operating agent for this initiative. And we partner with, we have more than 40 partners for these initiatives. And the goal here is to help uh, many developing countries, right, and, and emerging economies with their regulatory um, support. And we offer three services. Next slide, please. 
So the first service is Ask an Expert. So Ask an Expert um, is designed to help policymakers in developing and e emerging economies to identify and implement clean energy policy and finance solutions. We have experts uh, from around the world and to date, we have responded to 300 plus requests submitted by 90 plus governments um, since inception. The second service is training and capacity building. So we organize and host a webinars like the one that you have dialed and joined in. Um, so we deliver, we have delivered over 300 webinars training over 20,000 public and private um, sector stakeholders on various uh, topic areas. And the third resource is resource library. We have over 1,500 curated reports, journals, um, articles, which are free for public to um, access. And the great thing about Solution Center is technology agnostic. So um, I would request you to check the, um, check the website. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Back to you, Daniel. Thanks very much, Jal. So uh, as we mentioned today, we're going to be jumping, diving into hydrogen to support climate targets. Um, and we're going to be uh, counting on some really exciting uh, speakers today. So uh, our first speaker is going to be Steve Hammond. Steve Hammond is a, a senior research advisor in the Mechanical and Thermal Engineering Science Directorate at the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, as many of you know it, in Golden, Colorado. He leads a multi-lab project focused on renewables to hydrogen to green iron, steel, and ammonia production, and is NREL's lab lead for industrial decarbonization. Steve has a BA in mathematics from the University of Rochester and a PhD in computer science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. We also have Dr. Ping Ping Sung, uh, who is a group leader at Argonne National Laboratory, where she leads the hydrogen and electrification analysis group. Her research focuses on assessing new technologies and energy systems through process modeling, techno-economic analysis, and life cycle analysis. She assesses the economic performance and environmental impacts of a variety of technologies for energy production and materials manufacture, including e-fuels production, uh, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen production, and use in industrial processes, fossil and renewable fuels, refinery analysis, chemical iron and green steel production, plastic waste production, and more. She holds a doctorate in chemical engineering from the University of California, Davis, and conducts her postdoctoral training at UC Berkeley. Uh, my name is Daniela Ruff. I will be your moderator today. I am also based in the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I'm an inter international project manager focusing on working with governments and their decarbonization strategies. So great to have you all here, and let's go ahead and dive into the agenda that we have for today. So I'll be kicking us off with a very high level introduction on how hydrogen contributes or can contribute to climate targets such as net zero targets, uh, long term strategies, even nationally determined contributions. Um, and then we'll really dive into uh, the, the technical side of what is the potential for hydrogen, what are the, the different derivatives that can be that can be developed with hydrogen from clean hydrogen or other sources, um, how can we use clean hydrogen to decarbonize domestic, commercial, and hard to abate or hard to decarbonize sectors, uh, and some very specific examples looking at steel uh, and utilization of clean hydrogen in the steel industry. Uh, we will have a Q&A after Steve's presentation. I would like to say if you have questions during the presentation that you would like him to address directly, uh, please raise your hand. We, we encourage this to be very interactive um, and more of a discussion format rather than uh, our speakers just presenting to you. So again, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, you can also put your, your questions in the Q&A uh, or any comments that you have in the chat and we'll try to address those as quickly as possible. Then we'll be diving into a very practical application uh, presentation from Dr. Ping Ping Sun on the uh, greenhouse gas regulated emissions and energy use and technologies, or better known as the GREET model. Um, and this is a, a really exciting model that can be used to, to analyze uh, greenhouse gas emissions and life cycle emissions associated with different production pathways uh, for hydrogen and its derivatives. Um, again, we'll have you know 20, 25 minutes for Q&A, uh, which can be to either Dr. Ping Ping Sung, or also Steve, if you have any questions that, that you thought of after his presentation. Um, so again, really hoping this will be dynamic, a, a great discussion, and let's go ahead and, and kick off our, our presentations. 
So just to remind everybody, and I don't know if all of you participated in, in the last webinar, um, but we talked a little bit about hydrogen is, is often considered as kind of climate Swiss army knife. And, and that's really because, you know, hydrogen can be used for a number of applications, um, you know, from aviation and shipping to chemicals and processing, power system, transport, heating applications. It's, it's a very diverse, very flexible, um, you know, uh, energy carrier and, and really offers a lot of opportunities even as a drop-in fuel. And, and Steve's gonna dive into that a bit today. Um, if you go to the next one, but the real question is, should we use it as a Swiss army knife and should we use it for everything? You know, if you're building your house, would you use a Swiss army knife or might there be more appropriate tools? And that's really what we're trying to help you understand throughout this webinar series is when is hydrogen the best tool for the job? When is it the most appropriate, the most efficient, the most uh, cost-effective tool for the job. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, and as you can see, when we're talking about decarbonization, you know, at the global scale, we can see that hydrogen, although it plays an important role, um, may not be, you know, the, the largest contributor to decarbonization. So again, we're trying to figure out what are those really niche, you know, important applications for hydrogen as we're going forward with our decarbonization strategies. So we can see that the share of, of hydrogen in total final energy consumption by 2050 in a, a, a net zero energy scenario uh, is around you know 10 percent as you can see with that that sort of orange part of the bar chart here and then looking over in in this chart on the right we can see that hydrogen represents about six percent of cumulative emissions reduction by mitigation measure in a net zero energy scenario by 2050. so again hydrogen is important but it's also important to recognize that there are other decarbonization strategies that contribute to net zero decarbonization targets and we really want to find you know what are the those important niche competitive applications for clean hydrogen. Next slide, please. So as we look at, you know, a typical decarbonization pathway, um, this is a, a graphic of full decarbonization at the global scale. You can see that obviously it's divided among electricity sectors, industry sectors, transport sectors, building sectors, and you start seeing, you know, hydrogen popping up with greater prominence as we go forward towards that 2050 net zero target. So by 2030, we're seeing about 150 megatons of low, tar low carbon hydrogen with about eight 150 gigawatts of electrolyzers, and that's that's almost tripled, if not quadrupled, by 2045, uh, and we see it going to about five times that by 2050. Um, with the greatest uh, involvement of hydrogen and contribution of hydrogen to industrial sectors, chemical sectors, these hard to abate sectors that that we always mention. So we're going to dive into those a little bit during this uh, during this meeting, but we'll go ahead and go to the next slide just to present uh, kind of a distribution of how some of these projections see hydrogen playing into these global decarbonization strategies. Looking at 2020 to 2050, we can see, you know, over a five-fold increase in hydrogen deployment uh, throughout different subsectors and applications. From 2020 to 2050, we also see a very significant increase in the share of low carbon hydrogen. So these little gray dots as you, as you move towards 2050 are increasing to near 100% low carbon hydrogen by 2050. Um, a vast increase from what we see in 2020, um, you know, less than 20% low carbon hydrogens. So that's going to be one of the biggest differences. And then across all of these different applications, you can see a continued progressive increase in their in their deployment. Um, and just, you know, what are all of these applications? As we mentioned, you can use hydrogen for almost everything in the energy sector. You can blend it in the gas grid. You can use it for electricity generation, buildings, roads, shipping, aviation, refineries, industry. And then as we get into, you know, some of the, the more niche applications, iron and steel that Steve's going to present today, um, those are some of, of the harder to abate sectors that, that are really important as you get closer to that kind of last mile of that decarbonization pathway by 2050. So we'll go to the next slide, please. 
And here just showing kind of an accumulative uh, global emissions abated by hydrogen by 2050. Again, we see, you know, very low amounts of low carbon hydrogen deployed, you know, between 2020 and 2025, as that's really ramping up globally, uh, it's not contributing as much to global uh, carbon abatement or emissions abatement. But as we move towards 2050, we really see a very rapid and, and almost exponential increase in the deployment of low carbon hydrogen, mostly for power Power generation for transport applications, but then we also see it being used for aviation, uh, maritime uses, uh, building heating industry, uh, ammonia for agriculture, refining, which is one of the more typical applications today, and then we see it being used for steel. So uh, again, steel, aviation, maritime applications, really those hard to abate sectors. Um, so I'd like to pass it over to Steve at this point to really dive into a few examples of these hard to abate sectors and, and how we see hydrogen being used. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Um, as, as you mentioned, hydrogen is poised to play a significant role in decarbonizing hard to abate industries. So I'm going to dig in a bit on actually what role it does play, in particular focus on iron and steel and a bit about um, transportation fuels. Next slide. So I'll, I'll I'll talk about the industrial decarb grand challenge, um, a little more about iron and steel, e-fuels, then I'll wrap up with some uh, observations and conclusions. So next. So part of the grand challenge um, is figuring out how we can reduce the emissions from these hard to abate sectors. Um, the United States has a goal to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by 2050. And if you look at where the emissions are currently in the upper um, right of the chart here, um, about a third of our emissions come from buildings, um, a third from the transportation sector, but another third comes from the industrial sector. And within the industrial sector, over 50% of the emissions come from a disparate range of industries and applications. So part of that challenge is identifying, you know, what are the sources of emissions as a part of the, of the feedstocks, as a part of the processes. And so, you know, there really is no silver bullet that is applicable across all of um, these sectors, whether it's cement and lime, food products, iron and steel, chemicals, or refineries. So, um, you know, finding the, the appropriate solution. And often what we found is the appropriate solution um, depends on where this is going to be done. So something that we do, you know, in you know, Northern Europe may not, may not directly apply to Africa, but you know, the, the fundamentals will be the same, but there'll be tweaks in how to do that optimally. Next. So thinking about these hard to abate industrial sectors, um, you know, globally, um, iron and steel is, is responsible for somewhere between seven and 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions, chemical and petrochemicals, another 6%, aviation, 2%, you know, cement, lime, concrete, another 3%, shipping, 2%. And decarbonizing these hard to abate sectors is not gonna be achieved through efficiency gains or electrification alone. Um, they need a fuel source for heating or part of a chemical process. So success in decarbonizing these is gonna require a holistic approach and integrating multiple diverse technologies and processes that have not previously worked together. Next. So the US Department of Energy has launched an initiative called hydrogen at scale. And it really is one of those holistic um, uh, viewpoints of how to you know, steam methane reform of natural gas. Um, de deployments of alternative, so using renewables to electrolyzers, um, technologies are advancing rapidly, volumes are going up, you know, cost of electrolysis and the renewables are coming down. So, um, 
things are trending in the right direction to be able to cost effectively produce green hydrogen that can be used in these um, hard to abate industry sectors. Next. So I'm going to sort of give you a, a deeper dive on iron and steel. As I mentioned today, um, global um, iron and steel production is responsible for about 8% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are two routes in the US of how we produce steel. One is um, from iron ore, we um, use the route to the left. So you take iron ore, it, there's some pre-processing, then with the heat and pressure, um, it's, it's pelletized. So you get you know, marble-sized um, pellets of iron ore that's combined with coke in a blast furnace. So high heat, the, you know, it's, it's then onto a, a basic oxygen furnace for um, final forming of your steel products, whether it's rolled or cast. Um, so everything from electrical steel, automotive steel. And that's extremely efficient and effective at producing high quality steel. And one third of US steel is produced that way. Unfortunately, it's responsible for two thirds of the iron and steel emissions in the US. So the challenge is develop cost competitive zero emission technologies and infrastructure appropriate for US feedstocks and the full spectrum of steel end use products. In the US, there's already been a significant move towards lower emissions steel formation. So that's the through the electric arc furnace. So similarly, there's a, a, a processing step to produce iron ore pellets. You can then do direct reduction with, with hydrogen. Uh, I'll say most of our use of electric arc furnace um, comes from recycled scrap um, and, a, and a bit of it from the direct reduct, uh, the hydrogen direct reduction step. So in the hydrogen DRI furnace in the middle, um, hydrogen is heated to 900 degrees Celsius combined with these DR iron ore pellets. The hydrogen interacts with the oxides in the, um, in the iron ore and the emissions instead of CO2 are um, water vapor. So it's a, it's a clean process. Um, and as I said, two thirds of the US steel production is already based on this electric arc furnace process and um, one third of the steel emissions. So we're trying to focus on reducing the use of the, reducing the use of the blast furnace and do more to go to the right side and use DRI plus the EAF process. Next. So this is sort of a Sankey diagram because iron and steel is not a simple process. And so starting on the left, I talked about the blast furnace route. Um, and if you follow the, the blue lines across the top, the blast furnace route is extremely efficient at producing end use steel for automotives, um, for shipping, for um, mechanical purposes, electrical steel, whereas the lower part of the chart um, shows where tolerances for impurities such as copper weigh in. So if you're gonna produce rebar, for example, um, you have a higher tolerance for copper, but if you're doing electrical steel, automotive steel, you need almost 0% of uh, you know, uh, impurities such as copper or tin, which are common in uh, the, the uh, use of uh, recycled scrap steel. So what we want to do is, you know, find ways we can reduce the blast furnace. So shrink the number one, increase the use of the DRI um, for, you know, H2 DRI to make a primary route of steel that would cover that full spectrum of um, steel end use products and also Im improve our processing of scrap, perhaps find ways of reducing um, the impurities in the scrap. So better separation technologies. Um, so the focus here is then to be able to um, use, use the full 
suite of DRI plus EAF to cover all of the end uses. And so it's really not a, a simple process. So it's not simply we just, oh, we just use hydrogen instead of coal or coke. Next, please. So if we take a look at what that integrated process is, and as I mentioned, part of it is using processes, technologies that really haven't you know, interacted previously. So when we think about the full integrated system and we analyze where that can be done and what the costs are, we think of everything from where do you get your water from? So we need, we need a source of water. That water needs to be treated to get to deionized water that would feed a um, electrolysis. We think about what are, the, what are the green sources of electricity that are used to drive the electrolyzer. You need some amount of, of pumping and, and pressurization. You need some local storage. If your hydrogen is generated, you know, maybe 100 kilometers away from where it gets used, you need a pipeline or some mechanism for hydrogen transport. Um, then you need local storage because hydrogen is not necessarily readily available. And if you're sourcing this from renewables, there's some intermittency in the renewable side. So you wanna use your local hydrogen storage to buffer um, the intermittency of the renewables and the hydrogen production because um, uh, you know, steel production is considered a steady state process. The steel industry likes to operate, you know, north of 8,000 hours a year. So you need some on-site storage to buffer that. So you would then feed clean hydrogen, iron ore pellets, and you need to be, you know, sensitive to the ore types and, you know, how that affects your uh, operation of your electric arc furnace. So this is a simplified diagram, but it gives you a sense of what all needs to be considered when you're thinking about decarbonizing iron and steel. Next. Yeah. So big picture thinking about that, the water you need, electricity, hydrogen, and iron. So just, you know, just in case somebody stops you, you know, after the meeting and, and asks, you know, how much water does it take? So it takes about nine liters of deionized water and 55 kilowatt hours of electricity to produce one kilogram of hydrogen in a PEM electrolyzer. And it takes about 80 to 100 kilograms of hydrogen in that hydrogen DRI process to produce a ton of metallic iron from iron ore. So if we then wanna think about that integrated process of iron ore to DRI to electric arc furnace, if we wanna replace one blast furnace worth of steel production. So that's a million metric tons of metallic iron per year. It would take about 80,000 to 120,000 tons of hydrogen per year to replace one, one blast furnace that has an annual production of a million tons of iron per year. And that's about you know, you know, 4.4 billion to 6.6 6 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, round numbers. It's about a gigawatt of new green electricity generation. Water, it's a lot, depending on your you know, units, your favorite units, about 2000 acre feet of water per year. And as I mentioned, iron and steel is a steady state production as an industrial process. Um, set it and forget it is their ideal. There's a, a bit of flexibility, but you know, pipelines and storage essential parts of this infrastructure to get hydrogen to where it gets used from where it's generated and the buffer between potential variable generation and steady state end use. Next. So there's a, a very well-written um, industrial decarbonization, de decarbonization roadmap that, that came out from the DOE about a year ago. And it discusses a really important role that hydrogen plays in decarbonizing iron and steel. But what I think was missing was the roadmap is largely silent on the critical role that hydrogen storage is gonna play. So using hydrogen for iron ore reduction, economic viability is reached when the procured cost of hydrogen is $1.70 per kilogram or less. Well, to account for 
lower quality iron ores. In, in the US, most of the high quality iron ore has already been mined. And you're gonna need to put a little more effort in the beneficiation to, to remove some of those impurities at the pelletization step. Also, the DRI step with hydrogen, um, you're gonna need to um, worry about sort of acidification in the electric arc furnace, maybe lower yields. So you really need to get your delivered hydrogen cost. That includes the pipeline and the storage closer to a dollar a kilogram to really spur industrial change. So that's a huge lift. Um, so we, we need to do this and to de develop rapid adoption of low or no, no carbon processes that will help use um, you know, clean hydrogen. Next. So shifting a little bit, thinking about e-fuels, same thing. It's, it's a little simpler, the process. So if you have a source of, of green hydrogen, so you start with water, just like before, generate, you know, you can split that water to get your, your green hydrogen. You have some source of T CO2. It could be direct air capture or captured. Then you have a lot of options of, of where you can create these synthetic hydrocarbons and you know, slightly different routes, but the chemistry is a little simpler than worrying about the feedstocks in iron and steel. So you can get to then gasoline, you can get to SAF and diesel, you can get to maritime fuels. Some of the first generation for direct air capture is gonna be based on either solid adsorbents or liquid adsorbents. Um, but these are relatively high capital expense and high operational expense. So CapEx and OpEx is relatively high currently, but, but it can be done. There are established conversion technologies that can be used based on either methanol or using Fischer tropes, um, including reverse gas water shift. So it's, it's possible to have multiple routes to produce these spec fuels. But what, what isn't there yet is a integrated solution that goes from similar to iron, iron and steel. How do we get from low carbon electricity, low carbon hydrogen production in this integrated step. It's, it's a little different than the current refining processes in place. Next. Just to check, are there any questions so far on utilizing hydrogen for steel or for e-fuels? You can either raise your hand or, or put it in the Q&A. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll plow ahead, I'll, almost done. We can open up for Q&A. So thinking about, you know, here's a, a cartoon of what a future e-fuels plant could look like. So you think about, I've depicted renewables here, but it could be your, you know, pick your favorite source of low carbon electricity generation to um, electrolytic hydrogen production or your favorite, you know, low carbon hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, some source of, of CO2, then with the you know, chemical process for um, developing these e-fuels. And there's a variety of, of spec processes that can be done. We anticipate that e-fuels demand will initially be driven by aviation, but e-fuels in, in slightly different form can also be used for shipping and rail. Um, not covered directly here, but you know, e-chemicals is also a potential long-term sink for CO2 in products and plastics, all you know, perhaps bio-driven. Next, please. And just similarly, just thinking about sort of orders of magnitude. So depending on the product, you know, which of these, whether it's e-fuels for aviation or um, heavy duty road transport or maritime, it takes about you know, a third of a kilogram of hydrogen and two and a half kilograms of CO2 to generate a liter of e-fuels. You know, just in case somebody you know, randomly stops you and, and wants to know what that is, you'll be able to whip that answer out. Almost all the electricity will be based in the electrolyzer. Um, splitting water takes effort. So what I wanna show is you know, per unit of e-fuels, if you think about where the electricity gets um, used, so if you're gonna use a direct air capture unit, about seven and a half percent of your electricity for this you know, per unit of e-fuels 
goes to the DAC unit. The electrolyzer is just over 90%. Reverse water gas shift, a um, little less than 1% and less than half of 1% in that Fisher trip. So you really need to, to think about, you know, the electrolysis and, and fortunately the you know cost of electrolyzers is, is coming down. Um, so if we think about you know in the bigger picture, um, approximately if you wanted to replace 100% of US aviation fuel today, it would require a little over half of the current US electricity production. So you know that, that's a big number and, it, and it's rather daunting. Um, from a shipping perspective, uh, you know, a recent IEA report estimates that about 70 million tons of either ammonia or methanol will be required. So about 12.6 million or 14 million tons of hydrogen required to make up just 10% of the, of the um, share of fuels in the maritime sector by 2030. So that's you know, that's a equivalent to, you know, 100 or 150 percent of the current total hydrogen produced in the U.S. So it can be done, but there's a, a big shift underway, right? So I just want to make sure when people talk about, you know, hydrogen is poised to make an impact, and it is, but there is a, you know, significant amount of new green electricity generation that's gonna to need to be uh, deployed to get there. Next. So in, in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act policy with it, which has incentives is really gonna be a game changer in hydrogen production. So we've looked at behind the meter, purpose-built, um, uh, you know, hybrid energy systems, specifically driving electrolyzers, um, these would qualify for the full $3 a kilogram credit. Um, in absent pipelines and effective distribution, um, hydrogen storage cost is a, is a potential barrier to you know, the effective use of hydrogen in industrial decarbonization because that storage um, plays a key role in buffering between potential intermittent, which in many places in the world, you know, renewables are the cheapest source of, of green electrons. Um, so renewable resources and energy use. So depending on the quality of your renewable sources and your industry end use, if, is it potentially dynamic or is it a steady state? That will drive your storage requirements and your storage capacity needs. In the US, um, current bulk hydrogen storage costs range between you know, two or three cents a kilogram in salt caverns or you know, some sort of geological storage could be hard rock um, features up to $3 a kilogram in pressure vessel storage. So if you think about that, what I said earlier, if you're trying to get your delivered cost of hydrogen at a dollar a kilogram and your storage costs are $3 a kilogram, it's hard to get the math to work. The economics just aren't there. But low cost bulk hydrogen storage that's you know maybe 4X what salt caverns is, is really essential in you know, regions that don't have access to geological storage. And next, please. So I want to acknowledge um, I'm working part of this five lab consortium. Um, a special shout out to Ping Ping. She's our next speaker. So we work across the lab system and this work was supported uh, by the Department of Energy, Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology Office and the Wind um, Energy Technology Office. So with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you very much and look forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so we've already got some good questions here in the chat. Um, first one is how to make hydrogen production cheaper as the electrolyzer technology is still quite costly. You know, that, if I had that answer, <laughs> <laughs> we could all retire, right? We'd all be rich. Um, that's a great question. So I, I don't have a good answer to how to make it cheaper. I mean, certainly, um, 
you know, steam methane reforming um, is cheaper than current electrolytic approaches, but we, you know, it doesn't help if you're worried about emissions. So I think the key is finding lower emission um, processes or, you know, there, there are some who advocate for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, that's certainly um, you know, something to be explored. And depending on you know, where, you, where you are, that, that can be effective. It, it isn't something that I have focused my work on. I'll, I'll say we focused on, can we do this at all? And what are the technologies needed to do this um, with a focus on zero or, or near zero emissions, you know, primary emissions from the get-go. So we focused on, you know, renewables because they're, they're you know, in many parts you know, of the world, they're the cheapest source of electrons. And in the US, we will benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act incentives that are there. So it's possible and we're hoping that we can you know, increase the volumes, be, you know, help support early adopters, reduce that risk, and you know, provide that opportunity in a way that um, everybody you know, globally can benefit from advancing these technologies and, and driving the cost down. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I wish I had a better answer than, <laughs> it's, I know it's expensive now. I, I, we, you know, if, if you wanted to sign a contract you know, right now for a dollar kilogram hydrogen delivered. I just don't know where that would come from. Well, and obviously the price of, you know, the costs of renewable energy are decreasing. We do have yep. really amazing opportunities yeah. in the Southern hemisphere for, you know, large scale economic deployment of renewables. And so that's, that's helping yep. as well. And that's why we're seeing some of these kind of hydrogen hubs starting to pop up. The, the, the trends are in the right direction. Yeah. And yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, I don't know if there's more questions, but you know, there are. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll answer questions. All right. We... All right, sounds good. So you mentioned that uh, the price of hydrogen um, between one to one point seven dollars per kilo is required. Uh, what are you seeing as the current price or cost of hydrogen today, without it's, subsidies? Yeah, it's about four to five dollars a kilogram. Well, again, steam methane reforming. It's you know a little under $2 produced um, in, in the US. That, that's my understanding. If you wanna do it through electrolysis, it's largely driven by your cost of electricity. And depending on your utility rates or your, you know, your you know, levelized cost of electricity at four or five could be you know, $7 a kilogram. So it's, it's hot. Mm -hmm. you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, do this right now if everything else in the value chain existed. You couldn't produce cost-effective you know, economic steel at that. But we're trying to look ahead to you know, what could be 10 years from now, anticipating these pieces and not waiting 10 years from now, but trying to get a start so that we, we begin that work to look at the integrated technologies, start to think about maybe where um, industries in industrial parks could share some of the infrastructure, maybe look for synergies where, you know, there may be an exothermic process in one part that can, you know, interact with an endothermic process in a, in a disparate industry, but find ways that they work together and share in that, you know, hydrogen um, production. Mm -hmm. And obviously incentives today, you know, such as the production tax credit, uh, help significantly to bring those costs down as, yes. as we're bridging that gap. And um, next question, can you elaborate more on the established conversion technologies for decarbonization of e-fuels with using isotopes and methanol? It was touched on briefly during your presentation. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I will say I'm, I'm not a fuel, I'm not a chemist. So I'd, I'd be happy to, um, point you to somebody who's a who's a better electrochemist or if if uh, if ping ping has thought about this or is an expert I, did I'm you sorry. hear the question ping ping uh i heard a master now yeah can you elaborate more on the established conversion technologies for decarbonization of e-fuels with using isotopes and methanol 
Ah, uh, yeah, that is a great question. So generally, when we consider e fuels to use a clean uh, hydrogen um, produced from uh, you know green electricity or low carbon electricity and CO2 from different sources, we consider several major pathways. One is the conversion to methanol. Another is through uh, fish traps of uh, you know pathway to produce uh, such as uh, sustainable aviation fuels or like diesel. And there is a great interest to convert methanol to uh, uh, to distillate. That means like a jet and a diesel as well. So all these have been like extensively, you know, studied of great interest. And for all these pathways, the major uh, cost driver is the hydrogen cost, uh, as Steve just uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, so whenever the hydrogen can be reduced, the uh, cost can be reduced to like say. Uh, sub one or two dollars, and the production of e fuels can be potentially economical. Great, thank you. I uh, hope that answered the question. Uh, please feel free to add any additional questions on that for, for further clarification. Um, thanks so much, Ping Ping. And uh, next question Can we say that steel produced with hydrogen as fuel can have a better quality than steel produced with traditional fuels? That one's for Steve. You know, I would say that's going to depend. Um, it's certainly possible, but it's not necessary, right? So the, the steel end use requires, you know, certain, uh, I, I would say, the crystalline structure of that steel that supports, whether it's, you know, in the automotive, it's um, electrical end use, I wouldn't say it's necessarily going to have better, but we certainly wouldn't want to have lower quality. And that's, that's the biggest challenge. Um, I'm not sure if this, if, you know, we have a, a certain quality, you know, such as, as strength or durability. And the, we wouldn't want to necessarily go above what's required if there's added cost, right? If it can be done cost effectively, that also provides an added benefit, that would be a bonus, but it wouldn't be a requirement. I think they typically look to say, you know, within the steel industry, what is needed? What do we need to satisfy this in terms of, you know, corrosion resistance, right? Or, um, you know, strength and durability. Um, and once once those targets are met within, you know, within uh, acceptable rates of uncertainty, they don't put additional effort because there's typically a cost associated with it. So we wanna find you know, economic ways that, that definitely meet the requirements. And, and as I said, whether, whether those are you know, durability, resistance to corrosion, um, strength. So all, all of those you know, desired properties, we wanna be able to hit that, but not necessarily exceed it if there's a, you know, additional cost penalty. Yeah, thank you. And, and then the last question, you know, we always talk about hydrogen and transport being used for heavy uh, vehicles, um, you know, buses, mining vehicles, that sort of a thing, but not so much for light duty vehicles. Um, so do you see hydrogen being used in light duty vehicles to decarbonize the transport sector in the future? So, I think it's going to depend. Um, you know, I, I, there's a, a lot of news lately about hesitancy and, and sort of um, maybe market interest in electric vehicles being, you know, maybe reducing a little bit in the U.S. Um, it comes from, you know, range anxiety. Where, where can I recharge? Clearly, you know, a small amount of, of vehicles, you know, passenger vehicles can be effectively done with battery electric vehicles. Right? If depending on your personal need for transportation on a daily basis, if you're right now going to take, you know, a long trip in the U.S., you know, cities are spread far away. We're, we're unfortunately very, you know, married to our you know, cars. And if you're going to drive several hundred miles, people think about 
what's the temperature outside, right? Because your battery range is going to drop if, if it's cold, right? So I think it's going to depend. I'm a huge advocate, personal, of fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, the fueling characteristics are just like what you experience with, you know, an internal combustion engine, right? You pull up, you can add hydrogen, it behaves just the same. And then you, you know, hydrogen fuel cells, you know, within a passenger vehicle. And I've, I've had a lot of interactions with Daimler and uh, worked with their early automotive fuel cells. They're amazing, right? If I could, if there was a conversion kit, where I could drop in a fuel cell into my, you know, I'm going to, you know, unfortunately I have a larger vehicle and I do a lot of, you know, trips into the mountains for, you know, camping and skiing. And I would love a fuel cell electric vehicle because it would behave exactly as my current internal combustion engine. It, as you get longer distances and heavier payloads and you want to go, you know, you know, we don't have the fueling infrastructure yet with fuel cell, you know, for hydrogen distribution that we have for battery electric. So I think the technology is further ahead in the fuel cell electric vehicle, but the infrastructure to support recharging and battery electric and the opportunity that, you know, you can recharge your electric vehicle at home, you know, trickle charge it or, you know, level two charging. I mean, you can, you can do this now. So there's hesitancy about the vehicles. So it's really going to depend. But I'm, I'm a huge fan of of fuel cell electric vehicles. It's just, I think the the adoption uh, of electric vehicles is a little a little further ahead. Mm -hmm. But certainly, as you get to buses, as you get to trucks, I think the advantages are clearer in fuel cell electric vehicles. Right. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple more questions that came in, so I think we're okay on time. Uh, let me know if we have a red flag. Does your team have any case studies or ongoing research on cost-effective hydrogen storage facilities in any archipelagic typhoon and earthquake-prone regions in the world? Uh, so we have not looked globally. Right. So, I, so I'm not familiar I mean, so the salt caverns that I'm familiar with in the U.S. are along the Gulf Coast. So that's you know, sort of Texas, Louisiana. Those are areas prone to you know, hurricanes. Um, but I've, I've never heard any talk about their susceptibility to extreme weather events. Um, I'm also have not heard any concerns about you know pressure vessel storage you know above surface storage of hydrogen also in, in the case of extreme weather events whether it's cold or high winds or extreme heat I, you know, maybe others have i just i have not heard of that as a concern probably one of the huge advantages of underground salt caverns as well particularly in these cases, if, if they the, have them available. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the salt cavern storage, at least, you know, in the U.S. along that Gulf Coast, is not an area subject to earthquakes. Also, in, if we look at, at other, you know, hard rock formations, you know, if you look at the, the picture that's being shown under the D and the I of discussion, sort of the upper Midwest of the U.S., there are hard rock formations there that are particularly um, suitable for, you know, bulk, low cost hydrogen storage. And that's another area that is not especially susceptible to, um, you know, uh, earthquakes. So that, that would, that's, that's a fascinating question. And if anybody wants to explore that, I mean, we need some additional expertise in, you know, you know, sort of, you know, folks with understanding what, what the shifts would be, um, you know, what the impacts are of earthquakes in particular on subsurface storage. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly a lot of white hydrogen available that's been stored subsurface for millions of years as well. So, yeah, well, I'd, I'd also <laughs> use that as a starting about, point. 
<laughs> I'd also worry about those same sorts of, you know, extreme events um, if we were talking about CO two, you know, storage. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna if we're gonna capture it in storage, what are what are possibilities of disruption from, you know, uh, from earthquakes? So in, any anytime you're storing gases in particular subsurface, even at even at relatively low pressure, um, the opportunity for geologic burps or something would be a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. Great, and it looks like we have one more question, and uh, this may be a, a question for your colleague Jen King as well. Um, can you elaborate a bit on hydrogen electrolysis for ammonia or with ammonia? Is it currently being utilized in agriculture? I don't. I mean, most like ninety nine percent of hydrogen produced today is steam methane reforming. And that, that's used for um, enhanced oil refining and it's used for fertilizer production. So because of the cost of electricity, electrolytic production of hydrogen, it's not the, the most effective, you know, especially, you know, most cost effective way to produce ammonia for any end, end use. But there are, there are companies who are looking ahead to the tax incentives available, you know, again, a bit of a US lens, um, the tax incentives for both renewable production, hydrogen storage, the, um, the electrolytic green hydrogen production that can then effectively produce hydrogen then using, um, you know, some process to produce that ammonia and doing that at a modular scale. There's a company not too far from us called Starfire Energy. They have a three shipping container building block. So one, one shipping container is the electrolysis, one shipping container is the air separation to get nitrogen, and the third is their sort of mobile ammonia production. And, you know, it's, it's quite effective. Um, and they're just looking for the, you know, incentives and looking ahead to what they could do. But that's a, you know, a great think, think of agricultural use where you can on site, if you have, you know, access to renewables, you can then do that water splitting, air, air splitting, and ammonia production sort of in this um, mobile modular unit. It, it's pretty incredible. And it's I dynamic, think just to right? so, yeah yeah Go so Hub, Hubber Bosch is is really effective and you you can you you know maintain that Hubber Bosch process it tends to be steady state um, but if you had a green source of hydrogen you know the the whole you know in in the U S most of that hydrogen production is these big integrated um, you know, industrial processes. So all, all in one, they're doing, you know, steam methane reforming, they're taking the natural gas that's used in the heating, it's used in the Haberbosch, they, they're splitting the natural gas, they're, they're getting that ammonia and then using the Haberbosch to fix the nitrogen. So that, that's how most of the ammonia is being produced mm -hmm. you know, in, in the US and it's, and it's cost effective supplies our fertilizer and, needs and you know it's a huge boost to agricultural production yeah. but, but there are, there's possibility in the next 10 years of you know how to think about that differently and dramatically reduce the emissions mm -hmm. perfect um and also i think that the liftoff report had some interesting stats on ammonia being kind of one of the, the biggest applications for clean hydrogen especially as a result of the um production tax credit. And one of the interesting things we've seen internationally is that the cost of, of conventional ammonia has gone up so much due to supply chain issues that it's actually become you know, becoming more attractive and competitive to produce it locally with electrolysis driven hydrogen. So certainly an area to keep an eye on. Yep. And very quick comment or question, uh, very last one that came in. Can you comment on the technical barriers and costs for direct solar to hydrogen conversion technology? Maybe you want to answer that in the chat or in the Q&A, um, just in the interest of time, unless if you have a quick response to that one. I'll, I'll say <laughs> that. Um, 
the I, I love solar, but the problem with solar is night. So if you can get your utilization, right, your capacity factor up, if you've got super, super cheap solar and you can justify, you know, idling your electrolysis um, when the sun's not shining, um, if the economics work, that's terrific. But know that it's, you know, you're going to have a shutdown of your electrolysis and doing a daily dynamic you know, complete shutdown of your electrolysis is going to reduce the life expectancy of your electrolyzer. Great. Thank but, you. But love it. I mean, if you can do it, <laughs> absolutely. And the economics work, you know, go for it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. And I hope you'll stay on because um, we, we will have a Q&A at the end as well. And if you have any other questions for Steve, please put them in the Q&A chat. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on now, it kind of in the context of what Steve presented in the role of hydrogen in helping to uh, support hard to abate sectors uh, with a specific focus on steel uh, and other applications. Now we're going to dive a bit into how do we conduct this analysis on determining what are the real benefits and decarbonization reductions that can be um, obtained by using green hydrogen or clean hydrogen for these hard to abate applications or for any application. Uh, so now we're going to dive into the degree tool, uh, which again focuses on how you can analyze uh, life cycle emissions associated with different hydrogen utilization pa pathways. And for that, we're going to invite Dr. Sun, Ping Ping Sun, to join us uh, for this presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Sun. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ping Ping San from Argonne National Lab. Uh, so here I'm glad to talk about a great model uh, an analysis used for hydrogen uh, analysis for production as well as uh, application. Uh, next slide, please. So as I still mentioned, um, so hydrogen is currently used in United States by large quantity. So annually there are about 10 million metric ton of hydrogen, mainly consumed by refineries and ammonia production, as well as some other applications. And uh, uh, most of the hydrogen currently is produced th through steel methane reforming by using natural gas. While smaller amount of hydrogen can also be produced uh, by some uh, current uh, industry as a by uh, byproduct, such as chloral alkaline plants, as well as the steam reforming uh, plants. So, oh no, sorry, uh, uh, cr steam cracking plants to generate uh, uh, propylene and uh, ethylene. Those can also generate uh, byproduct of hydrogen and has the potential to export them. Uh, next slide, please. So you have seen this uh, a scheme of like a hydrogen at a scale, which is a DOE initiative. Uh, given it has been talked earlier, I will not talk too much about it. But just just to mention from life cycle analysis point of view, we need to uh, analyze the full supply chain or value chain. So in that case, we need to understand the individual uh, stage or part of the supply chain, including the production of uh, hydrogen and then the production or manufacture of the up stream of a uh, hydrogen production, such as uh, uh, natural gas recovery or electricity generation. And once hydrogen is generated, we need to consider the burden associated with hydrogen transportation, or namely infrastructure. And meanwhile, when hydrogen reaches the end uses, uh, such as the steel production or refinery operation, then the decarbonization effect will take place. So we also have through studies about the hydrogen application in different end users. So it is worth mentioning that uh, the H2 scale, it really is, has a pretty impactful, oh, uh, it serves, I think it's the, <laughs> It really serves as a blueprint for the bipartisan infrastructure law or bail that was passed in 2021. Also, it's worth mentioning that a great model is mentioned in the recently passed IRA tax bail to use to analyze the hydrogen production GHG emissions. Next slide, please. 
So regarding hydrogen analysis, you may wonder how do we conduct this analysis? So generally, we consider the different metrics of hydrogen um, technology evaluation. We conduct a technical economic analysis and the life cycle analysis. And the approach, the data is generally generated from process modeling as well as industry uh, input and also literature information. By using this information, we can uh, uh, estimate or derive the mass flow and energy flow information, which serves as a basis for economic assessment and the life cycle analysis. So the deep understanding of these fundamental uh, technologies is the key to uh, conduct a high quality analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So you might have heard of a great model. So that is uh, the full name is the greenhouse gases, regulated emissions and energy use in technology model. So this is a life cycle analysis model has been developed, developed by Argonne National Lab since like 1995. Uh, so you can uh, visit this website to download the version. So this model is uh, updated annually to capture the technology advancement and also adding like emerging technologies. We have global users about more than 55,000. And then uh, so grid model, we mainly consider, we mainly include two sub models, grid one and grid two. We also have some other derived uh, models as well. For these two models, uh, main models, grid one generally uh, summarize the fuel production uh, pathways, such as uh, uh, refiner fuels production, ammonia production, uh, electro fuels production, hydrogen production, and et cetera. And the grid two generally is for the eco cycle, it includes the materials of manufacture needed for it the eco components and the for uh, you know currently we have uh, such as the steel like uh, aluminum uh, battery and etc so there are many manufacturer production pathways um again you can really find the detailed information in our great website from our national lab uh, next slide please so great model, for both models, we consider the different, uh, uh, with several key uh, categories of uh, environmental impact metrics. So for example, we have uh, energy consumption that includes total energy fossil, which has a breakdown of natural gas, coal, petroleum, and we also account for uh, renewable energy consumption, such as electricity consumption for hydrogen, et cetera. And we consider and the estimate air pollutants, which is important for air quality, such as VOC, CO, NOx, SOx, and the PM. And the important metric, as you know, it will be the greenhouse gases. We consider each single category of uh, uh, GHG, such as the CO2, uh, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide. And for all these, we also uh, sum them up for like a CO2 equivalent. Are shown here. And uh, for each technology, we also consider water consumption. Uh, for example, that is a key factor to be considered for hydrogen production. As the study mentioned earlier, it consumes a larger amount of hydrogen. So when we consider green hydrogen production, you may consider whether you know this area is arid or it has plenty of fresh water supply. Um, next slide, please. So after talking about the metrics of a greater model, now we can uh, switch gear to about specifically hydrogen production. Uh, so for example, for hydrogen uh, production, we consider the conventional and the incumbent technology, uh, such as uh, uh, hydrogen from a steam methane reforming or SMR by using natural gas. So grid model includes a different uh, natural gas recovery data, including uh, North America, um, which is the average of the uh, mining wells from uh, North America, and also uh, non-North America uh, data for uh, natural gas recovery. We consider different technologies as well, uh, conventional various shale uh, gas production. Uh, so when this natural gas is produced and processed in a natural gas plant to separate the NGL, they're compressed and they are transported through a pipeline to the end user to produce, uh, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen. And the meanwhile, you need great model. You also have the kind of option to turn on CCS option or CO2 capture and uh, storage. From there, the CO2 um, um, emission can be reduced. So in addition to conventional uh, production by using fossil-based natural gas, we also consider renewable natural gas, such as uh, the gas produced from uh, MSW, 
or uh, multiple solid waste. So from there, you know, but when we use the RNG, the GTG emissions of the hydrogen uh, production can be reduced. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the green hydrogen today, we generally consider hydrogen produced from electricity. And as you know, the key is the electricity sources. So for grid model, we uh, include uh, uh, electricity, uh, GHG emissions, and the generation profiles from different sources, from the conventional coal, natural gas, uh, to the uh, newer technology or uh, emerging or increasing usage of renewable energy, such as the biomass. And also we have a, a good amount of data about the uranium uh, electricity, which was just recently updated. And uh, also uh, electricity from wind, uh, solar, and hydrothermal. So all this electricity can be used for hydrogen uh, production. But of course, the renewable you know, has the effect of reduced GGG uh, emissions. So great model includes not only the emissions and the hydroelectricity uh, generation from individual source also provides the uh, electricity GTG for regional uh, based on the um, electricity uh, reliability uh, air region. We have the uh, different carbon intensity for different uh, um, regions. Uh, next slide, please. So here it gives you a flavor about how we use a grid model to evaluate hydrogen GTG emissions. Uh, here lists some several uh, major pathways. For example, from steam methane reforming by using natural gas, uh, the GTG emission is over 10 CO2 uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. When we consider the steam credit, uh, you know, that is co-produced from a process, the emission can be reduced to about 9.5. And then when we consider CCS, CO2 capture and sequestration, you can see that it reduced the GGG emission significantly to about 3.5. So that is a great reduction. And then when we consider electricity generated hydrogen by electrolysis, you can see it really depends on the electricity pathway. For nuclear, we have a little bit of burden. It comes from uranium mining. And for wind or solar, uh, you know, we show zero emission. So it's worth mentioning is this GTG emission has the boundary of from wells to gate uh, that is uh, defined by the uh, 45V uh, tax bill. So from wells gate, that means that it includes a hydrogen production on-site emission plus an emission associated with the upstream uh, energy input and the materials input. So for example, for SMRR, that will include uh, uh, natural gas uh, uh, pro recovery and uh, separation as well as uh, transportation. And for wind and solar, that will be just electricity generation. So that's why it shows like a zero uh, uh, GTG. Uh, next slide, please. However, you might ask the question, well, wind and solar shows zero emission for wells to gate uh, by accounting only electricity generation and the hydrogen production on site emission. However, we are aware that you know, when we generate a solar, uh, you know, PV panels, or we produce, manufacture the wind turbines, we do emit a lot of GTG emissions. So that comes to another category of life cycle analysis is the so-called embodied emission. Uh, so you can see some like, uh, uh, you know, a scheme here, embodied emission or infrastructure emission. So that refers to the emission associated with the manufacture of the materials for construction uh, for fabrication and uh, you know other processes. So, for example, from here you can see there's an emission associated with uh, uh, cement production, with steel production, with uh, uh, you know like say uh, solar PV, wind turbine, and the nuclear or plant construction. So when we consider all these together, you can see we do not you know actually the uh, burden associated with uh, electricity generation is a non-zero for wind or solar. It's actually it's quite noticeable. Uh, you can see the embodied emission is small for coal and natural gas because the plant has a long lifetime. Well, for solar, it is really uh, quite noticeable. Uh, for uh, also is the case for wind and it's geothermal. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then for hydrogen uh, production, when we consider, okay, we have an embodied emission associated with the electricity generation. What about the electrolyzer? So that is a great question. Then we also conducted the analysis to estimate what are the emission associated with the electrolyzer, especially for different technology, you have different components and you have different lifetime. So we also account for that analysis. You can see alkaline electrolyzer is, seem, uh, is observed to have uh, the highest amount of emission. Emission, but it's still small relative to uh, the embodied emission associated with electricity uh, generation. Uh, next slide, please. So now when we combine these two elements together, embodied emission together for like hydrogen um, uh, electricity uh, generation and for electrolyzer, uh, electrolyzer manufacture, when they combine them together, you can see the hydrogen production burden from a solar powered PEM reach two kilogram per kilogram of uh, hydrogen. So when we compare to like SMR CCIs, even if you remember, so for SMR CCIs, the um, uh, emission is about 3.5. And with wind and solar, when we consider unbounded emission, it already, they reach the uh, two uh, kilogram already. So it is really quite a sizable. Um, next slide, please. Uh, talking after we talk about uh, hydrogen production and also hydrogen embodied uh, uh, you know uh, emission. Uh, so now we you know switch gear to talk about the uh, hydrogen application. Uh, for example, for vehicle use, there was a question regarding this earlier. So we uh, estimated the hydrogen uh, for vehicle use by using leveraging the uh, argon uh, internal produced model of autonomy and also EPA model of moves uh, to provide the fuel economy as well as the air emission data. Uh, by considering that, uh, you know, the combined uh, fuel cycle, com combined cycle, vehicle operation cycles, we can estimate the average fuel economy for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, vehicles or fuel cell vehicles. We incorporate this data into a grid model to allow a full life cycle analysis from production to vehicle operation. Uh, next slide, please. So before hydrogen can be used to, uh, to an application, as you mentioned earlier, there's a big uh, uh, you know, challenge, uh, to, you know, which is so-called so infrastructure to transport like, hydrogen. So hydrogen compression, liquefaction, and uh, uh, transportation can be quite uh, energy intensive. So great model may include the hydrogen infrastructure burden, consider both the liquid phase and the gases phase uh, um, uh, transportation. We also have the burden used for like a refueling for fuel uh, for vehicle operation. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and the use for applications, uh, we can uh, you can you might consider that uh, one hydrogen used for like a fuel cell vehicles, we not only need the hydrogen to be clean, such as a green um, a use generated from green electricity to produce a low carbon you know impact, we also need to consider the fuel economy. How much, uh, you know, how many miles can one kilogram of hydrogen uh, support the vehicle operation? Um, so from here, you can see the both factors really have an important uh, uh, impact. So for example, for here we list a comparison between uh, among the different vehicle types. For class six vehicle, uh, you can see the fuel economy of uh, uh, of like a fuel cell, if it is relatively uh, Two, two times of that of the diesel uh, vehicle, we can see you can see we show significant GHG emission even when we use uh, uh, you know hydrogen produced from SMR, we can reach like fifty seven percent of a GHG reduction. And we can use a clean electricity for hydrogen uh, uh, production. You can see the emission of reduction is more than ninety percent. It's significant. When we switch to different uh, uh, vehicle mode or uh, vehicle uh, types, you can see. Despite the uh, fuel economy uh, ratio of hydrogen over diesel, it can be started to diminishes. 
But even when even when it reached almost the parity, we still showed a GGG reduction benefit by using uh, green uh, hydrogen. But if we use the hydrogen from SMR, you can see uh, the reduction impact is really limited. So when we consider hydrogen application for vehicles, two key factors, hydrogen production source and then the fuel economy of the vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, when we consider this uh, operation, we also needed to consider the energy associated with the uh, hydrogen delivery. Uh, so here is just give an example of the uh, cost. Um, so uh, this is that um, in addition to great model, Argon also um, generated or like uh, produce the HD sun model that is for hydrogen infrastructure study, including the transportation and the refueling mode of uh, uh, hydrogen. So from here, you can see the hydrogen liquefaction is really energy intensive. Uh, it have some effect of economic skills and efficiency gain by using uh, uh, you know larger quality, but the still relatively it would cost about four to six dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. It's almost cost the same amount for hydrogen produced by using uh, electricity. So infrastructure is an important uh, piece of, of our element for hydrogen uh, analysis and hydrogen application. Uh, next slide, please. So here shows an example. When we consider all these elements together, hydrogen production, hydrogen transportation, by liquefaction or gases transportation uh, by, by pipeline or tube trailer, and hydrogen refueling that requires uh, uh, liquefaction or requires uh, uh, compression, and then we combine all these together and consider the different vehicle elements for different vehicles, such as engines, steel, aluminum, plastics, uh, uh, carbon fiber for hydrogen storage. We can have a full life cycle of hydrogen application in vehicle operation. You can see here is the hydrogen pathway. Then consider vehicle burden, production burden, and fuel production burden, you can see hydrogen fuel cell can have significant less uh, GGG emissions compared to the incumbent technologies or ICE engines for either gasoline or diesel or using uh, CNG. So that is summarized in our cradle to grave uh, report sponsored by uh, DOE. Uh, next slide, please. So after talking about the hydrogen um, application uh, in vehicle operation, now we switch gear to talk about the hydrogen application in different uh, areas, such as industry decarbonization. As Daniel mentioned earlier, so hydrogen can be seen as a Swiss knife. So here is one of the applications. So we conducted a pretty through uh, hydrogen use for refinery operation by using the actual US refinery uh, 2019 operation data. So we considered we had to conduct, uh, conduct a deep analysis about the energy consumption profiles and then uh, analyze the decarbonization opportunities. So by considering using uh, RNG instead of NG, by considering hydrogen uh, replacement for hydrogen from SMR, and also uh, consider the implementation of blending of bio crude, we can have a pretty good roadmap about the uh, refinery decarbonization. You can see when we use green hydrogen for just replace the uh, SMR hydrogen, we can have a pretty limited impact for refinery um, reduction because most of the CO2 is emitted through um, uh, through vehicle operation. That means it sourced from the carbon embedded into petroleum fuel. So to dig deep, deep decarbonize the refinery uh, uh, GHG emissions, extend, including the transportation uh, operation, then we need to use, uh, uh, we need to change the uh, feed stock because that is the leading CO2 source. However, I will just consider the wild to gate, that means excluding the vehicle operation side, then hydrogen replacement can have an impactful, uh, can, can, be, uh, can be quite impactful for, G, for GHG reduction, uh, including uh, for refinery operation and for crude, uh, for upstream uh, burden. Uh, next slide, please. So there's uh, some question about the ammonia earlier. That is a great question because that is a key uh, potential application for uh, green hydrogen use or like inlet, uh, outlet. So we, uh, excuse me. 
Uh, so we, we, in terms of like uh, ammonia production, we uh, well, analyze the benefit of uh, green hydrogen usage as a green ammonia production. Um, we generated the mass flow and the energy flow by process modeling using ESPEN data. So we compare modeled and compared the uh, green hydrogen uh, green ammonia production with uh, green ammonia production from natural gas, natural gas and also blue ammonia production. That means the natural gas derived the ammonia with the CCS. So from the result, you can see the impact of hydrogen uh, cost. Uh, hydrogen has a kind of significant uh, you know, impact uh, cost driver for uh, green ammonia production. So we need the green, green hydrogen to be less than $1, uh, around $1 for this process to be like economical. But the meanwhile, you know, you producing uh, green ammonia has a significant environmental uh, benefit. Uh, you can see compared to the high emission from natural gas based uh, ammonia production, using regenerating green ammonia by using using nuclear energy or using uh, wind and solar, we can uh, reduce the GGG emission by more than like 90% uh, significantly. Uh, next slide, please. So we also analyzed the, the hydrogen application for steel uh, manufacture. As I mentioned earlier, there are many technologies for steel manufacture decarbonization, such as smelting, such as the DRI direct uh, reduced iron. We evaluated the two technologies. One is uh, a DRI, another is FIT process, which is called the flash iron reduction, which is a smelting process. So both uh, for other processes by using hydrogen, uh, you know, to they reduce iron or we observed that we needed the hydrogen cost to be about less than $1 per kilogram for this process to be economical compared to the incubant technologies. And on the other side, we do see significant impact of GHG reduction by using uh, hydrogen to replace uh, coal as a reducing agent. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there's also questions about uh, electrofuels production. Here I may give an example. Similarly, we uh, analyzed the uh, uh, electrofuels production through process modeling, economic assessment, and the life cycle analysis. So here you can see we model this process by using validated experimental results from literature and uh, designed the system to go through reverse water gas shift reaction. Uh, and then uh, generate methanol. Currently, we are also investigating the best type of methanol production uh, by di directly converting CO2 and hydrogen into methanol. So when we compare the you know, economics, again, we see the same thing. We need a hydrogen cost to be low. Uh, I know it is challenging, as we all know, uh, but this is uh, how the process needs to be economical. And of course, uh, the, implement, uh, the implementation of uh, tax credit can help the economics of the plant uh, significantly. But when we look at the uh, environmental impact, we can see here is the incumbent technology, that means the methanol produced from natural gas, and they almost generate 90 kilogram of uh, a gram of uh, CO2 per megajoule of fuel. However, However, when we switch to the green methanol production by using CO2 and clean hydrogen, you can see the data is shown here. So again, we observe more than 90% of the GHG reduction. So for the electrical fields, uh, these data are included in grade one model in the type is called the uh, E-fields or electrical fields. Uh, next slide, please. We also consider the CO2 from different sources. So here is another example. Oh, there's overlap of the slide. Uh, so here's another example. As I mentioned, uh, in addition to methanol, we also evaluated the e-fuels production by using facial traps processes. And for this process, we designed the system to really maximize uh, the diesel uh, yield. And this process, of course, can be uh, tuned or tailored to generate uh, like a, a jet fuel production. So basically, the takeaway message is from this is again economics of the plant is heavily dependent on the uh, uh, on the hydrogen cost. And the meanwhile, uh, so the uh, GTG emissions of this uh, process 
um, is uh, contributed from uh, the how is the CO two is collected and how is the hydrogen is uh, how C, uh, how the feedstock such as CO two and the hydrogen are uh, generated from water energy sources and how they are transported and how they are processed because you also have some uh, uh, unrecoverable CO two uh, emitted from the process. But even if I consider all these elements together, again, we see more than 90% of GHG reduction by using FT uh, fuel uh, for uh, transportation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this one is probably my last example about the hydrogen uh, uh, blending and the hydrogen uh, transportation. I know we talked about the hydrogen transportation uh, barrier earlier. So here is some uh, uh, interesting project that is to compare how this uh, project is uh, like uh, emerges between infrastructure and the hydrogen application uh, comparison. This uh, scope is to compare how the hydrogen can be you know uh, transported economically. So option one is we can, uh, with given the current uh, infrastructure um, barrier or absence of the infrastructure for hydrogen, we can blend the hydrogen with the natural gas to see what is the potential uh, benefit. And alternatively, we can uh, uh, convert hydrogen to natural gas or synthetic natural gas. It is also part of e-fuel by combining with the CO2. We evaluated the economics and also the GGG emissions of these options and to see what is the uh, benefit or what is the winner. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the like synthetic natural gas, I will not talk too much uh, here given the time limit, but basically similar with the other stories of uh, e-fuels production, the hydrogen cost is a key cost driver and synthetic natural gas is expensive. And alternatively, it will be uh, blend the hydrogen with uh, uh, natural gas and for transportation. Do we have a benefit in terms of for GGG emission? We know it is going to be expensive, uh, so we're not. I'm not going to put the additional information information here. But the, the interesting information is about the GHG uh uh, benefit. So when we consider hydrogen blending into natural gas, because of a hydrogen has a lower energy density compared to natural gas per volume, so therefore we need to consider different scenarios. One is to keep the same volumetric flow for the pipeline, and therefore whenever we increasing the hydro blending level, we're going to see reducing energy content. And alternatively, we can keep the, the same energy flow, but in that case, we have to pump the like uh, the compression, how to make uh, the compress and the transport the uh, gas with a, a higher rate to compensate for the lower energy density generated from uh, hydrogen blending. So these two cases yield different results. Uh, so from the left side, you can see, but we have volumetric uh, energy flow, and while we also deliver less energy per volume, we do see uh, we do see life cycle GGG emission benefit because we do not see uh, you know the energy demand does not really increase by pumping, and therefore when we have the hydrogen delivered at a constant rate, we see significant GGG emissions. And you can see there's a uh, you know, slightly decrease of the uh, pumping burden or transportation burden. However, on the contrary, when we think about the constant energy flow, despite uh, the uh, the end product of hydrogen blended natural gas can have a lower you know carbon content in the end application such as orange bar. However, the burden for the infrastructure that means the compression uh, station to pump the gas. Uh, we see the uh, increased burden. That is because to compensate for the uh, energy uh, density, we need to really compress at a higher um, compress and transport the gas at a higher rate. That increases the uh, compression burden significantly. And for the pipeline, the compression is really powered by the combusting the uh, high blend gas or the gas carried. So therefore, in this case, even when we have a decreasing carbon content with increasing hydrogen blending, we still see the overall uh, limited impact of GTG reductions. So for all these are considered by a uh, green hydrogen. It will use uh, hydrogen from SIMR with CCS. You can see the result will be even very, uh, uh, the result of a GT reduction is really minimal. So that's uh, the in interesting takeaway from hydrogen blending for transportation. Uh, next slide, please. 
I think that's all the content I have, and this work is greatly supported by DOE offices, uh, so especially for uh, uh, EERE hydrogen office and for uh, several other uh, offices. So thanks for the great support, and thanks for the attention from the audience. Thank you so much, Ping Ping. That was really an amazing and comprehensive presentation. I, I know there's a lot of questions. Um, we'll try to address all of them. So we'll start off with, is access to the application? Um, I, I understand referring to the GREET tool, but please correct me if that's wrong, restricted to the US alone or other countries uh, have access to the utilization of it? Uh, yeah. So thanks for the interest. So great model, it is a public tool. So it is a free download for you know uh, global users. And then meanwhile, for the other applications, and many of them have been published for uh, journal articles. And some of them are published even for like a public, uh, uh, you know, uh, open like access uh, articles. It's really for global users. Great. And then there's also interest in tutorials and walkthroughs. Um, if you have any detailed sessions on how to use the different modeling tools for hydrogen technologies, um, specifically hands-on session and case studies, if you have any webinars in particular that you would recommend, if you don't mind putting those in the chat, that would be really helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Uh, so actually for great model, I know it, the model is quite enormous and complex. So actually we have some uh, tutorial, mod, uh, tutorial classes in uh, YouTube. So when you search like a great uh, uh, tutorial, uh, you know, in YouTube, you will see a series of classes. And then meanwhile, Argonne National Lab also hosts uh, like workshops once per two or three years. Uh, so uh, the workshops are really open for uh, like users and they can you can come to uh, attend the meeting and uh, discuss with uh, our like center developers uh, for some fundamental you know understanding. And we have some uh, webinars or we have presentations here and there. Uh, so please keep an eye on like a DOE website. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And I see that uh, some folks have put the links in the chat as well. So, um, so take a look at that. Um, so we have another question. When you're producing hydrogen from methane, you get gray hydrogen. After CCS, you can make blue hydrogen. Um, how much... Uh, how much hydrogen is produced finally? Is it decreased? Can you give some examples of quantities in terms of, of that production pathway? Uh, yeah, that is a great uh, uh, question. So um, you, this information you can find in great models. So on top of my head, I remember for uh, isomer hydrogen production, the efficiency is about 72%. So that means that to generate one, uh, well, like say to generate one megajoule of or one million BTU of hydrogen, you need to divide uh, like one um, they divided, divided like 72% efficiency. That means it's roughly about 1.4, uh, you know, million BTU of natural gas. But when you can dark consider like a CCS, you need to use additional electricity, you need to use some steam. Uh, so it does compromise on some efficiency. However, because SMR process, it generates some byproduct steam by heat exchange. So when we do CCS, we utilize these byproduct steam uh, to help like, uh, you know, say solvent uh, regeneration, and et cetera. So overall, the efficiency uh, decrease is limited. Uh, if I remember correctly, after CCS, the efficiency is about 65 or 66 percent. So you do see a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact. But overall, the GHG reduction is, uh, you know, significant, you know, from 10 to 3.5. Great. Thanks very much. Um, next question is, it's not clear why the embodied emissions for coal are so low. Shouldn't the emissions associated with the mining of coal also be included? Uh, yeah, that is a great, uh, a, you know, um, question. So the activities associated with the coal is already considered in the upstream of coal recovery. So, you know, the, for the slide I show, it does not include the activities, uh, you know, associated with, uh, you know, uh, recovery because that's already included in the current supply chain or value chain. That means upstream burden for like say for coal or natural gas or for like a petroleum or crude oil. Now embodied emission is really about the materials of manufacture and the construction. Like say for coal power plant, you need a cement, you need a steel. So the embodied emission is just the, the emission associated with uh, this part. 
And because of coal power plant has a very long lifetime, uh, I do not really exactly know uh, how long. I don't remember on the top of my head, but let's say if you have 60 years, you have 80 years, and then that's why, you know, at the average that you per kilogram of uh, electricity, so per kilowatt hour of electricity, your burden is really small. But then when we consider the PV, uh, you know, solar panel, or we consider the wind turbine, the lifetime is a lot shorter. And also the burden associated with the manufacturer could be really significant. So when you average considering these factors, then that's why you see bigger impact on the of wind and solar hydrothermal relative to coal and natural gas. But that's, again, that is about the emission. We still need to consider the upstream for recovery as well. When you consider all these together, you will see a complete picture. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have tools like REIT to help us with. <laughs> yes. Um, Next question, what is the feasibility of green hydrogen-based transport? I know Steve already addressed this a little bit uh, in the yeah. Q&A, but if you have anything to add to his comments as well. Yeah, yeah, just totally agree with what Steve just, uh, Steve just mentioned. It is really, you know, depends. Uh, if in terms of technology, we know the technology is there. Uh, well, the, there are several challenges. So first is like infrastructure. How can we transport hydrogen, right? Right now there's only 1,600 miles of hydrogen in Gulf Coast. And uh, alternatively, we have to trust, and uh, you know, it takes uh, quite a long time to build the infrastructure. And meanwhile, we can use a, a tube trailer to transport hydrogen. It's added to about four to $6 per kilogram already. And then we've added refueling station, and then you need to comprise, you need a liquidify at another six to $8. So at the pump, you know, your hydrogen is produced like from one to five dollars, even for green electricity. But at the pump, you're going to see fifteen dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, even higher. And uh, not long ago, because of the infrastructure supply deficiency in California, you see like a hydrogen cost of like several tens of dollars per kilogram. Those are the barrier, uh, so we are aware of. And then meanwhile, it's also about uh, how is that compared to like the battery vehicles or EV, right? So for light duty vehicles, generally the EV uh, vehicle uh, is cheaper in terms of like a hydrogen a fuel cell vehicles. However, hydrogen vehicles do have an advantage at for like um, uh, you know for the mid or heavy duty uh, you know transportation. So for the heavy duty trucks, for example, when you consider these uh, you know operations, then hydrogen fueled vehicles start to be cheaper than EV for uh, heavy duty and mid duty. Thanks very much. A very comprehensive answer. Um, okay, let's see. Our next question is, can the techno-economics be extrapolated for use in Canada and, and other countries as well from what maybe may have been analyzed in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we consider economic assessment, actually, you know, as we know, it is a snapshot. It's a bind to specific design. Uh, let's just say for even for SMR, you know, there are so many SMR plants, but each of the design could be different by using different catalysts, by using different uh, uh, steam extraction or different like in energy integration. So for like, you know, for TA analysis for this hydrogen production, it is the uh, same way. When we consider the process modeling and the TEA, we took the, you know, design, uh, we designed a system by thinking that it might be the most economical way. And, uh, you know, uh, so we use the different heat integration technologies. When we move it from one region to another, it might be, you know, we can keep the same design, or I, maybe we can be optimized for different, uh, uh, due to the different advantage or different constraints. Uh, for example, uh, if we produce green uh, hydrogen, and uh, you know, in US, we, right now we model it as like a fresh water, but in some other region, and maybe there's no fresh water, they have to they do, do desalination. So they have to integrate the system with the desalination. All different regions, maybe they have hydrothermal, or they have some local heat from the different uh, nearby industry plant. So they might integrate that like, uh, you know, uh, heat input into the system, therefore reduce some electricity consumption. So it can be customized into the different, uh, you know, regions. Yeah, perfect. Um, thank you so much. And then we just have one last question for you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. They said you mentioned ammonia as a, as a hydrogen carrier. Can you elaborate a bit on ammonia cracking technology in the cases where hydrogen is needed as the final end use product? 
Uh, yeah, that is a great question. That is something we're also, uh, you know, um, doing analysis and work right now. So hydrogen technology, as we all know, it is a uh, uh, very endothermic, so it is energy intensive. Uh, so based on different catalysts, different technology, the cracking temperature can reach about uh, 400 to 700 Celsius. And then, you know, the design is also, uh, the process will also depends on how you supply the heat. For the country who are interested to import green ammonia and to use Utilize uh, you know green ammonia generally they do not have so much of uh, green electricity or green energy sources. Otherwise, they would produce hydrogen on site instead of uh, like uh, you know uh, you know transporting ammonia, right? So in that case, let's like say we design a system uh, to consume ammonia itself or even like hydrogen, a little bit of hydrogen to you know uh, assist this cracking. So this uh, energy is uh, it is energy intensive. Uh, so when you look at the literature information, the energy consumption can be up to 20%. That means when you import one metric ton of ammonia, 20% of that is used uh, right away to crack ammonia back to hydrogen. However, this uh, it, it seems a lot, but you also need to consider what's the energy and the cost uh, assumption compared to hydrogen liquefaction and hydrogen transportation. For example, if you do it overseas, it is long distance and it is costly to transport and to uh, you know liquidify. So the comparison between direct liquid hydrogen, uh, you know, uh, transportation, uh, ammonia transportation, then. Uh, you know, synthesis, transportation, and cracking, it really depends on case by case. So how far you want to transport and what is the energy use for your uh, ammonia, like a cracking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one last question, actually, that just popped up. Uh, again, thanks for the, the great presentation. Oh, they keep coming in. Uh, feel free to add your questions. Um, is there an opportunity to pilot a solution in direct air capture for the production of hydrogen and ammonia? And I imagine e-fuels as well would be added to that. Yes, yes, certainly. We are, you know, we have done some analysis of work for the direct air capture as well. And we all know it is just expensive, right? So currently there's a two pilot, two pilot scales. One is low temperature, uh, you know, by using like a mean based on uh climb climb works. Another is like carbon engineering technology for high te high, high temperature uh you know capture. So both the technologies, you know, there are great potential for future cost reduction, but based on on current development, the cost is still expensive. It's a several hundred dollars per metric ton. Well, by using industry CO2 when we capture, it generally is less than $100 per metric ton. Uh, but that is a very interesting, uh, you know, a still, uh, you know, we know DAC is expensive, but it is, has greater potential because that can be implemented at some remote areas, all right, when you have very cheap electricity and CO2 is, uh, you know, easy to transport. Uh, for you know either sequestration or for different industry analysis. For in terms of model integration, we can certainly you know integrate them. For example, we can integrate CO2 capture, hydrogen uh, you know production on site, and uh, you know uh, really sequester them to like a methanol and to transport a methanol out because it's harder to transport electricity and uh, hydrogen but it is easier to transport methanol. So in that case, we can harvest the remote abundant electricity, you know, and uh, you know, generate methanol. Right. And I guess uh, they, they added to this as well. Are there opportunities for other organizations to work with you on, on these types of pilots? Um, you know, what do you have any examples of that where, where you have worked with uh, pilot projects and how that yes. might look? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, similar. Uh, so we're really uh, work with uh, all like stakeholders. You know, we work with the DOE, we work with different industry partners to help decarbonize, you know, uh, different technologies. Uh, so that is... Uh, uh, just let us know, then we can, you know, discuss how to proceed. Uh, so Great. we are, you know, our role is really to help like a decarbonize. <laughs> <laughs> so that is certainly need the industry input. And, and real projects that. on the ground are very valuable. <laughs> yes, yes. So we yeah. always, uh, you know, appreciate like the input, uh, you know, feedbacks from industry and also always welcome their engagement. Uh, so because Great. decarbonization has to be implemented uh, by the, you know, actual uh, operations. 
Perfect. There were some um, questions in the chat and there was some back and forth on those, but regarding what are some of the uses and applications for oxygen? And then also some questions on transporting water, maybe to the, the final point of, of utilization instead of transporting hydrogen. Um, what are the trade-offs of that? So I don't know if you and or Steve want, wanted to address that in the discussion as well. Uh, yeah, so for in terms of uh, oxygen, uh, yes, we're aware of that. So in high, in the great model, you have the option to turn on or turn off the oxygen uh, credit. So for example, if you have uh, used the oxygen from electrolyzer, then you can avoid the hydrogen generated from air separation. Therefore, you receive some credit for G to G. Uh, so you can keep it, you can choose that option. In terms of water, um, so generally, <laughs> Uh, so for hydrogen production, you have uh, have two constraints. One, it is electricity, another is water. Uh, but the water is usually, it is a low cost, uh, uh, you know, um, a low cost, uh, you know, product. Um, so therefore, usually it would think it's not really economical to transport water. Okay, thanks. And Steve, I don't know if you had any responses to add to some of the latest questions as well. I just wanted to amplify what Ping Ping said that you usually look for a combination of water availability. And if you're thinking about low temp electrolysis that's driven by renewables, you try to find a place that has favorable water availability, low, low stress, and the availability of you know, favorable you know, wind and solar resources. Mm -hmm. So trying to trying to focus on one or the other is, is not going to result in an economical mm -hmm. end product. You know, yeah. I think one of the biggest uses of hydrogen right now, you know, you know that may be non-traditional is um, indoors where you're trying to move products around. And so um, it's uh, forklifts, right? So you don't necessarily want to have a forklift that's using some sort of you know, two-stroke engine or some some internal combustion engine. So, and you still want to you know move product around without the emissions and you know worrying about worker safety. So, yeah. um, that's sort of a early adopter in terms of a, I'll put it in, in quotes a vehicle for mm -hmm. you know effective use of hydrogen. And Perfect. The, Ox oxygen use just depends on the economics. It's, mm -hmm. you know, venting oxygen from the electrolyzers is not considered sort of a, a greenhouse gas. It's not considered an issue in terms of climate. But if you can effectively capture it and you have a off taker willing to buy it, the economics, that can all be fine. Mm -hmm. um, going back to hydrogen. There's, we've had interesting discussion with some of the hyperscale data center providers, you know, cloud providers, about using hydrogen and fuel cells as drop-in replacements for diesel generators. So this is a interesting twist. Um, you know, depending on where you're located, there may be restrictions on what you can use your diesel generator for because of noise and emissions. In the US, it's largely only, you know, you can test your integrated system for an hour once a month. Um, but otherwise it's for emergency uses only. But if you have critical infrastructure, I mean, it could be a hospital, you know, data centers use um, their diesel backup as, you know, to protect against electrical outages. And so the opportunity to use hydrogen, it can be delivered in, you know, pressure vessel, you know, you know, uh, pipe trucks, um, and then and it provides a drop-in replacement for a diesel generator. They're silent. Um, there's actually a, a number of benefits that you can get from using this. Um, they start up quicker, they're more stable. Um, some experiments we've done here at NREL, it's under a second when you can go from power out. So you need just a little bit of battery to bridge that gap. But in about a second, that um, hydrogen fuel cell can pick up the full load and be stable. 
Um, we've looked at you know DC from um, from fuel cells to provide um, power to a few racks of compute in a sort of demonstration of a carbon free data center. And that's quite effective. We were able to capture the heat from the fuel cell in a you know, uh, you know combined heat and power system. We use, uh, we use the heat for you know, heating offices and, and laboratory space. And the fuel cells are amazingly uh, flexible in load following. So for a, a cloud data center load, they were, they were effective. So the, it's starting to get some traction with um, Google, Microsoft, and, and Amazon. Sort of, we don't think about data centers as being you know, primary emissions, but the power that they use is, is massive. And so it's just a different way to think about you know, data centers. And, and I, I anticipate we'll see that you know, in the future. <clears throat> Absolutely. So I know we're almost at time, but I wanted to give you both an opportunity, unless there are any other questions, um, of course, feel free to add those. But if you just have any, any last comments in terms of, again, bringing it back to the focus of this webinar, how can hydrogen support decarbonization targets? Um, what are kind of the, the low hanging fruits that you're seeing? What are the main things we need to be thinking about right now um, and, and how to kind of prioritize those activities as we move forward with our decarbonization pathways? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Ping Ping, you want you want the final word or the first one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of I kind of just start and you know, um, so yeah, uh, that is a great question. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, my first uh, uh, thought would be that probably will take a concerted effort because for hydrogen, for broad hydrogen application, it needed to address like every single stage from the full value chain. Uh, you know, you, like say, it will, we have a, like an user, but hydrogen cannot be transported. They will not work. It will not, uh, you know, make an impact. Uh, so it does take effort from every single, you know, partner. So from the production to infrastructure to an application, you need to like adopt this technology. Uh, you need to like say, uh, really, uh, you know, maybe modify your other application, like say machines, engines to adopt this change. Thanks. Yep. And just to let you know, Steve, if you want to add this into your response, there was one last question that came in regarding regulations for hydrogen production, storage, and transportation, if you wanted to incorporate that into, <laughs> into your response. Yeah, I mean, I'll interpret the question as, are the regulations finalized? And mm -hmm. I, I think it's still evolving. And you know, we didn't really touch on safety, um, but... I, I think there's that adds to a bit of the hydrogen hesitancy. You know, the, there's the the Hindenburg. Everybody, uh, you know, I'd say that that's people point to that as oh, we can't do hydrogen um, because it, it's it's volatile. But um, I think there are very good codes and standards from a safety perspective that are well understood that can be applied. And then if you follow those, you know. Hydrogen is no more volatile than you know a, a spill of of any transportation fuel. Um, may, maybe even uh, um, safer because it's such an energetic molecule. If there's a hydrogen spill, it dissipates so so rapidly. Um, but I'll, I'll say you know from the viewpoint of the, you know, the the webinar in this event, you know hydrogen is poised to play a a significant role in decarbonization. Um, the, the solutions, the mechanisms, the technologies um, are gonna require some, cre some creativity in getting that sort of integrated system and to do it so that we have a transition plan that reduces the risk that can support the, the early adopters. And um, there are some things we, that are still you know, open. We, we don't have this infrastructure yet and sort of you know I, I think there'll be some sort of clustering in hubs or industrial parks where industries will work together to you know solve some of the infrastructure challenges we've talked about 
you know, distribution. We've talked about storage. These, these are big, um, you know, price points that, are, that challenge the economics of using hydrogen. But, you know, the trends are all headed in the right direction. The eco economics of renewables, you know, membranes for, for electrolyzers, volumes are going up. So everything is trending in the right direction. So I'm, I'm really optimistic and we really have a chance to, to do the right thing in a way that, you know, the, you know, everybody can benefit. So I, I'm excited. <laughs> we are too. That's why we have so many people here. Um, thank you guys so much. Really just very rich, exciting, uh, comprehensive presentations. We really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge with us. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in future webinars as well. Um, thanks to all of the participants for your amazing questions. Uh, and really, really happy that that it was uh, that you were so integrated and, and engaged in this discussion. Um, our next webinar in our series is going to cover a lot of the things that uh, both Steve and Ping Ping mentioned on the technical considerations related to production, storage, transport, distribution of hydrogen. Um, and then we're also going to dive into the H2, H2A light tool for techno-economic analysis of hydrogen production. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. Again, thanks to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. And I don't know if Holly or Jill, if you want to add anything else, but uh, you can use the QR code that that they just shared as well to get more information. Thanks everyone. Thank and you. And we have the link to the next webinar in the chat. So don't forget to copy that. Have a great rest of your day or Thank evening. You. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.